There are two main keys to understanding eye movements on EEG. The first key is to understand the polarity rules which have been discussed in a previous video. The second key is to understand the eye as a dipole. To review the polarity rules briefly, the EEG is based on looking at differences between two inputs. We express the output as a single channel where one input is looked at relative to another input. By EEG convention, when the deflection of the channel is upward, this suggests that input 1 is negative with respect to input 2, or conversely, input 2 is positive with respect to input 1. Similarly, by convention, if there is a downward deflection, input 1 is positive with respect to input 2, or conversely, input 2 is negative with respect to input 1. We will use these polarity rules to understand eye movements. This is a simple diagram of an eye viewed from the lateral perspective. Posteriorly, we have the retina, and anteriorly, we have the cornea. The retina is relatively electronegative, while the cornea is relatively electropositive. Let's consider the example of a simple eye blink. Here is a simplified diagram of the lateral aspect of the head of somebody having an EEG. You can see the eye in the center of the screen, a diagram of the eyelid, and a crude diagram of the nose. Let's consider what happens when the eye is blinked. The eyelid goes down, and simultaneously, the eyeball moves upward into the head. This is known as Bell's phenomenon. Let's think about where the EEG electrodes would be placed. In this situation, the closest electrode would be FP1 or FP2, depending on the side of the head. Next, further up the head are F3 or F4, and at the top of the head, C3 and C4. FP1 and FP2 would see the greatest amount of positive charge from the electropositive cornea. It is possible that there is a smaller amount of positive electrical activity at F3 or F4, but as these electrodes are farther away from the eyeball, this charge would be much smaller. And because C3 and C4 are so distant, they likely do not receive any of the charge from the eyeball. Let's think about this in terms of EEG output. Let's consider the channel FP1, F3. FP1 would have a very high positive charge, as we said before, and F3 has a smaller positive charge. If we remember our polarity rules, because FP1 is positive with respect to F3, there is a downward deflection at the time of this eye blink. Now let's think about the next channel in the chain. F3 does have a very small positive charge, and there is likely no charge at C3, and so there is probably a smaller downward deflection. Because both eyeballs are likely moving conjugately, we would likely see the same effect on the other side. Our suspicions are confirmed when we look at a normal EEG in which a patient is blinking his eyes. If we take a more careful look at the electrodes that we had predicted the outcome, we see that our predictions are accurate. We can use the same principles to look at horizontal eye movements. With horizontal eye movements, the best approach is to look at the head from the top down. In this diagram, we will use the example of a leftward eye movement. The electrodes that are closest to these eye movements on the left side are F7 and T7 in the temporal chain. On the opposite side, we have analogous electrodes F8 and T8. Anteriorly, and farther away from the eyes, we have FP1 and FP2. If we think about the dipole of the eye, F7 is closest to the positively charged cornea, and so F7 will experience a net positive charge. F8 is closest to the negatively charged retina, and so a negative charge will be recorded by F8 electrode. For the sake of simplicity, we can assume that the other electrodes are far enough away so that they are experiencing basically no charge at all. Now let's think about this from the perspective of the EEG recording. Again, first we'll look at FP1, F7 channel. F7 is experiencing a net positive charge, and FP1 is effectively isoelectric. Because FP1 is relatively negative with respect to F7, or F7 is relatively positive with respect to FP1, according to our polarity rules, there will be an upward deflection in this channel. If we look at the next channel in the chain, again, F7 is positive, and T7 is effectively isoelectric. According to our polarity rules, this means that we will have a downward deflection in this channel, and the recording might look something like this. On the opposite side, FP2 is effectively neutral, and F8 is experiencing a net negative charge. Therefore, according to our polarity rules, there will be a downward deflection in the channel. 
Again, when we look at the next channel down, F8 has a negative charge and T8 is effectively neutral, and so there will be an upward deflection. We can look at a sample recording of a patient who is having some leftward saccadic eye movements. In this case, the patient is actually reading a book. If we outline the channels that we have already predicted and look at them more carefully, we see that our predictions, based on the polarity of the eye and our polarity rules, are accurate. One useful shortcut to determining the direction of horizontal eye movements is to look carefully at the deflection of the baseline in the two most anterior temporal leads on one side and the other. In this case, with our leftward eye movement, the deflections are such that they move away from each other, creating a space in between the first two channels. We could imagine that we could fit an eyeball in this space. When you look at horizontal eye movements in the future, if you can fit an eyeball in the space between the first two channels in the temporal chains, then the eye movement is likely in that direction. If we look down at the first two channels in the right temporal chain, we see that the tracings are moving toward each other, eliminating space so that we could not put an eyeball in this space. This further confirms that this is an eye movement to the left. There is one last detail on this particular tracing you can see that there's a very small spiky waveform just before the eye movement. When we look at our diagram again, we remember that in order for the eyes to move to the left, the lateral rectus muscle has to contract. The lateral rectus muscle is very close to the F7 electrode, and so the initial activity before the eye movement is a small negative charge secondary to the contraction of the lateral rectus. This is known as a lateral rectus spike, and this artifact is sometimes mistaken for an epileptiform discharge.